Hi, good morning, uh, buenos dias. Thank you for joining us for day two of the California School-Based Health Alliance's annual conference. Um, my name is Sergio Morales and I'm the board president of uh, CSHA. Before we launch into another day of learning and building of community health uh, school champions, I want to introduce our wellness MC for this conference. If you joined yesterday's closing, you know just how special Lance is. Um, he is here this morning and throughout the conference to help ground us and make sure that we are present, um, that we are grounded and ready to take in a new information and our new learning and build systems of resilience for our students, schools, and communities. Lance is a wellness consultant with the East Bay Agency for Children, and in his role at Frick Middle School, Lance operates his the wellness room, which is a true sanctuary for students. So please uh, join me in welcoming Lance. Lance. Thank you, Sergio. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to this moment. Our first time here. Yeah, just take a moment, just settle in. If you're sitting, I'm gonna invite you to just make a mindful check of where are your shoulders? Make sure they're nice and relaxed. Make sure there's a gentle softness on the face as we go into our Wellness Wisdom Wednesday mindful moment right here and right now. I'm gonna tap my bell. Hmm. Let the sound of the bell invite you to close your eyes. Let the sound of the bell be the call to go inward for a moment by slowly breathing in and slowly breathing out. Remember to relax the shoulders, gentle softness in the face as we welcome the moment by welcoming the breath to be fully present and to regulate the nervous system to regulate any anxiety, to regulate any frustration. Let the breath be the power. Let the breath be the stream that flows back and forth. Welcome this invitation to this moment with the breath. Mm. Slowly breathing in and slowly breathing out at your own pace. And just observe if the mind is wandering in thoughts. You can say to yourself, thinking and return to the breath. No judgment, just a natural noticing of how the mind likes to get in the way sometimes, right? Slowly breathing in. Mm. And as you're breathing in, see if you can really take a little bit of a longer inhalation down into that lower diaphragm, bringing in all the oxygen into the bloodstream, maximizing, boosting your immune system. Yes, let that, that oxygen be the power. Be the power to settle in. In this moment, I'd like to invite you to see in the mind's eye, see yourself. Imagine what will your self-care look like for the rest of the day, during the conference, during the work day or being at home, whatever it is. What will your self-care look like? See it to be it. Name it and claim it to be your source of wellness. How much water will you drink to stay hydrated? What healthy foods will you eat to maximize the nutrients and the protein? Whatever your self-care is for you, be with that right now. As you're breathing in and breathing out this idea of wellness for yourself.
Next, I'd like to invite you to open up the heart space of grace and gratitude and take in for a moment something that you are grateful for that you have in your life. In the practice of taking nothing for granted, but honoring all the good that is available, could it be the shoes that you love to wear that are comfortable and that make you feel good? Could it be the outfit that you wear or the having access to hot water, whatever it is for you, in the practice of acknowledging some of the simplest things that maybe we forget about, but in some way, there's a benefit. It serves you in some way that makes life easier, comfortable, safer, whatever that is for you. See if you can connect in the heart on a feeling level of gratitude right here and right now. Breathing in and breathing out. Gratitude. And lastly, I'd like to invite you to say to yourself, or out loud, whatever feels right to you. May I be peaceful, healthy, and happy. May my students that I serve and their families, my clients and their families be peaceful, healthy, and happy. May my colleagues and peers, and maybe those that I have a hard time relating to, may they be peaceful, healthy, and happy. May my family and my friends in my community be peaceful, healthy, and happy. May the country and the whole world be peaceful, healthy, and happy. And so it is. Thank you, everybody, for the mindful moment on this Wellness Wisdom Wednesday. Have a great day at the conference, and I'll see you. When I see you, be well. Take care. Great. Thank you so much, Lance, um, for uh, help for that grounding for helping us get started today. Um, what I would like to do is just uh, you know acknowledge uh, the technical challenges that we had yesterday um, during Dr. Sean uh, Jen Wright's keynote, and remind folks that uh, his talk is on our website. Um, I also want to draw your attention to the chat that if people are experiencing challenges, there is um, guidance there in the chat about what you could do if you are experiencing challenges with feedback. We should have resolved a lot of those technical difficulties. In addition to that, just want to um, let folks know that the uh, today's uh, code for um, our uh, gamification that you can find on the left-hand menu, the code for our welcome is uh, welcome to. So please make sure that you include that uh, for our raffles. And uh, most importantly, I'm really excited to introduce our keynote speaker for the day, which is uh, Dr. Janine Jones, who is a professor and associate dean for academic affairs in the College of Education at the University of Washington. Her research focuses on providing culturally responsive intervention in schools, including the integration of cultural factors that are associated with resiliency in diverse youth. Her work also includes the study of identity and belonging as critical elements in school engagement for youth of color. There will be time after Dr. Jones uh, speaks for Q&A, so feel free to type in your questions and we'll hold time for them toward the end. Um, so please join me in welcoming uh, Dr. Jones, uh, Dr. Janine Jones.
Dr. Jones, the floor is yours. Thank you, Sergio. That was a lovely introduction. I appreciate you acknowledging all of my work and interests and desires on serving youth and families. And I want to extend a special thank you to Lance. My mind was in my way. And I, that mindful moment was really powerful for me and meaningful for me to be able to enter into this space. And I'm not sure I would have been able to do it as easily without you. So thank you, Lance. I appreciate you very much. So um, if we could, Marcel, if you could share my slides, that would be great. Um, I am going to go ahead and move to the next slide. And um, I want to express my appreciation to Marcel and Lisa for helping get me started. So what I want to talk about with you today is really the ways in which I think about culturally responsive school mental health. And I believe in working with youth of color in a way that may be different in um, what we are trained in our training programs to do. And in doing so, I think from the perspective of fostering resilience among students of color. So I, I'll begin by just having us, uh, what would like for you to kind of notice the body of the slide and that um, we are looking at a bottle and a message in a bottle. And I'm hoping that you will see the theme of this throughout my presentation on the ways in which we can respond to the needs of youth and helping continue and um, build with their resilience. So before I, I go, move on, let's uh, next slide, please. I just want to share a little bit about myself because oftentimes people want to know where you're coming from when you are sharing your perspectives, and it, it might reveal some of the ways, the reasons why I think the way that I do. Um, I like showing this slide because. It, this child is representative of a lot of things in my life and experiences that I've had and the interests that I have shaped when it comes to the research that I do. In my early years as a mental health professional, I worked in Compton, California, and I worked for a program um, that was serving youth of incarcerated parents. And I was in a training program. I was working as a paraprofessional when I did this work. And I was in a training program where I was reading about exposure to chronic community violence and was I was trying to learn more about African American youth and the ways in which they were be able to cope because um, some of the youth that I was working with in these these schools uh, with incarcerated parents also were exposed to chronic community violence and what I was learning this is in the early 90s and everything that I was reading um, to prepare for my groups was deficit focused Everything was talking about the prevalence of disorders, the um, violence in um, black communities and the ways that that kids were perpetrating violence or victims of violence, but nothing around strengths. And it, it troubled me and it was confusing to me that I didn't see anything positive about my own community. While, meanwhile, I'm serving these kids and I'm seeing how incredibly strong they were and how they were resilient despite being exposed to some of the worst circumstances you could imagine. So it just led me to study what fosters resilience in African American children and adolescents, particularly when they're exposed to chronic community violence. And at the end of my talk, I'll share a, a study that I did in Houston, Texas with kids of the same population and how resilience kind of manifested. But in general, my work focuses on adapting evidence-based interventions with a lens of cultivating resilience within the cultural context. So what works in one culture may not be effective in another. And so this is the reason why I'll talk to you about kind of common variables that you would want to be thinking about as you serve youth of color and the unique stressors that are experienced by them in particular. So I do have a bias. Let me just say what my bias is, that, that I believe that without an, uh, an intentional focus on culturally responsive practice, it just doesn't happen. So my hope today is that I can show you where culturally responsive practices kind of fit in evidence-based interventions and evidence-based practice. Next slide, please. So as we think about um, the evidence-based practice, I, I'm using the model that um, was defined in by the American Psychological Association with what we refer to as the three-legged stool. And basically paying attention to that evidence-based practice includes the best scientific evidence, of course. So research that is telling us what is the best scientific evidence for serving our particular mental health problem. 
At the same time, we also need to recognize that clinician is expertise, and it has to be integrated into that best research evidence with their clinical judgment as a major part, or your clinical judgment as a major, major part of what you do. But at the same time, as we're, when we're paying attention to clinician expertise, we also have to recognize it as clinicians that we have to be aware of the limits of our own knowledge and our own skills and the blind spots that can affect our clinical judgment. So two legs of the stool reference the research that exists and ourselves as clinicians and, and our degree of expertise and our own awareness of our own knowledge and limits of our knowledge. And then, most importantly, is the third leg of the stool. Notice it wouldn't be able to stand without the third leg, and that is to pay attention to client characteristics. And by client characteristics, I'm referring to things like sociocultural and family factors, including things like gender, gender identity, ethnicity, race, social class, religion, disability status, family structure, sexual orientation. All of those are sociocultural factors that we need to consider as we are doing our work. We also need to pay attention to the environmental context, and that includes things like institutional racism, healthcare disparities, stressors such as unemployment or major life events that are or traumas. Um, we also have to look at personal preference. So that's the uh, personal preferences and values of the clients that we're serving and the preferences related to treatment and the ways in which they think about treatment and their, and their worldview. So a central goal of evidence-based practice or evidence-based interventions is to maximize patient choice among effective alternative interventions. That's an, a critical element that we seem to lose sight of at times where we really give much more weight to the best scientific evidence as the major thing to pay attention to. Next slide, please. So, you probably have been familiar with the concept of ACEs or adverse childhood experiences. One of our sponsors today is Kaiser Permanente, and this was uh, um, originated by a study by Felitti, Anda, and all at all um, back in 1998 where they were studying the long-term outcomes of, of individuals and, and what happens when they're exposed to these experiences during childhood. And the study, the original study, as well as um, many more that have been replicated since then, show that those with four or more ACEs or adverse childhood experiences have an increased likelihood of serious health problems throughout life. And so they were looking um, um, back and so studying people that were adults and looked at childhood experiences that um, per perpetuated and created a context for um, like uh, in, in potential conditions such as depression anxiety, suicide risk, and substance use. And so it was very clear from these studies that it's critical to address these experiences earlier in life. So one of the things that I want to point out in this graphic that you can see, you've probably seen it many times before, but one thing to notice about it is that the ACEs in this study, most of them are related to of this childhood adversity is because of adult decisions, adult behaviors, in adult circumstances. That's really important to notice because then that tells us that as we are serving youth, that we, in order to serve them and intervene well with children, we have to engage the adults in everything that we do. If, if many, much of the adversity is due to the adults around them, we have to engage adults in everything that we do. So critical point about ACEs. But I'd like to expand upon this concept of ACEs. Next slide, please. As we are looking at the top part of this graphic, you can see the tree includes the ACEs that I just described. So adverse childhood experiences that we know um, that are part of the challenges that youth may experience in life. But I'd like for you to look below the soil look at the underground and another form of um, adverse childhood experiences. And so this study was done in um, 2017, where there was a notice that a recognition that um, their adversity is not just within the family, but also within a community. So we have a pair of ACEs here that 
We have individual and family ACEs as well as community ACEs. And notice that the ACEs below are a foundation of systemic inequities, systemic. So that tells us that if there's the foundation and we have these ACEs that are above the surface and part of the, the tree, when we consider that the pair of ACEs model, we have to really recognize that adverse community environments become another factor for consideration when we're working with stressed youth. So and in particular, I'd like to draw your attention to one community ACE. Um, click please and that is discrimination. That this is one that needs to be recognized and has recently been more um, importantly noticed in some of the national studies that we have. And I'll, I'll tell you about two where we've included them. So next slide, please. Here, the Philadelphia, uh, or the um, National Survey of Children's Health in 2016, shows that I'm showing here that they had decided to include racism and discrimination among one of the ACE indicators that they would study to kind of determine the prevalence of it, particularly in the, um, the uh, national survey. And you can see the bottom item, item H, it might be a little small, but it's um, basically identifying having adverse experiences related to um, being a member of a race racial group. Click please. Then in the uh, Philadelphia Urban ACE study, I want to show some of the differences that they found by race and what they were looking at were um, urban indicators uh, of community uh, ACEs, including witnessing violence, feeling discrimination, adverse neighborhood experiences, being bullied and living in foster care. And I want you to notice the asterisks next to the percentages. So on the left side, they compared white youth to black youth on the right side. And you can see that when there is a single asterisk, that's saying like there was a, a high, a, a significant difference between the populations. The greater number of the asterisks the greater the significance level. And you can see that there are three asterisks for witness violence, feeling discrimination, and for um, adverse neighborhood experience, and then also for living in foster care. So when you see these massive prevalence differences, it tells us that these experiences matter too, and they're now perceived to be clustered among the ACEs that we need to be aware of, but in particular for Black youth. Next slide, please. So as we think of adverse community experiences for children and adolescents of color, I just want you to recognize that there's significant complexity in whether they can cope with a range of ACEs, including community violence and discrimination and, and foster care. But some are more subtle than others. And so that's where I'm going to go now, is really talk about some of those more subtle ones that we may not pay attention to. And I want to describe a couple of concepts that relate to adolescence experiences that adults need to be aware of. And I see these as threats to resilience. Click, please. So take a look at this video clip. Next slide. What's happening here? It was a little glitchy there, but what you saw was a person that was walking up, looking inside a car window and um, looked at the back, looked at the front and then walked away. The question I have for you is car thief or lost keys? When I watched that video the first time, I had an impression that was in, I interpreted based on experiences that I've had. What we just saw, we had really limited information. We had no sound, we had no context, we were just observers. So what we do is we tend to align with what's familiar. With limited information, we also usually perceive a situation negatively if the other, somebody who's different from us, doesn't make sense to us. When I saw the video the first time, the first thing I thought was lost keys. 
The reason why I thought it was lost keys is because I once had a car that did not have a key fob and I had to put my key in the door to lock the car, but I could push the button down to get out of the car and locked my keys in many, many times. And the experience that I had looking for my keys was to keep going back and hoping that they were going to suddenly magically appear on the seat. They never did, but that was what would happen with me. And I saw that in him. He looked like he'd been at the car before. He looked like he had come by before. And what told me that was the ways in which he glided his fingers along the window as he walked away. But you may not have experienced it that way. You may have experienced the thought that he was a car thief. In fact, when I purchased this video clip, the title of the video clip was Car Thief, and it surprised me. The reason why we see this differently is implicit bias. These are culturally based assumptions that we make in a millisecond and they guide our behavior. We don't really know what we're thinking until we actually take an action oftentimes. But these, what's happening with implicit bias is they're shortcuts. It's our brain doing what it can to process complex information efficiently. They just add in, our brains add in details. We're hardwired to fill in the blanks. So that's what, what we were just doing when we looked at this video. So you might feel bad if you assumed he was a car thief, and I want you to not feel bad, please don't, because our society has primed you for that by portraying black men as criminals. Our society primed you for it. So you're likely to have filled in the blanks based on that experience, society preparing you or priming you to think that way. But we can do something about that. It means that you have to fight against implicit bias. You have to intentionally fill in the blanks by seeking additional information before acting. Next slide, please. Our behavior is powerfully guided by the things we expect to be true. So when we interact with people based on limited information or implicit bias, or we can refer to these as maybe cultural blind spots, some people have to have the experience of people interacting with them based on implicit bias all day long. And they have to figure out how to cope and manage around those feelings and not get overwhelmed and overburdened with trying to interpret what those, those feelings are. Some people are interpreted or impacted by implicit bias every day. And, and the experience is like when people, other people make decisions about who you are, what you're capable of, or making predictions about what you might or might not do. That's an adverse experience for many BIPOC youth, Black, Indigenous, people of color, especially Black boys. Now, from here forward, I'm probably going to refer to, I'll use the term BIPOC, and the reason why I want to use the term BIPOC is to center Black and Indigenous because many of our practices in schools have the greatest negative impact on Black and Indigenous students in particular. And so I will use that term BIPOC, but also I'm, for, for, I'm referring to youth of color, but my examples, you will kind of see how that fits in. Next slide, please. So oftentimes people feel a little bit helpless when I talk about implicit bias or cultural blind spots and the ways in which we um, uh, deal with this automatic process that happens in our minds. And I don't want you to, to feel helpless. I, I, there is plenty of research out there that has shown successful ways in disrupting patterns of um, implicit bias and cultural blind spots. So I'll just describe a couple here. Individuation is really taking um, intentional efforts to really see the person as an individual and unique and someone that um, demands and res uh, your respect and um, uh, time to get to know them. Perspective taking is to get a sense of what it might feel like being in that person's shoes and se separating yourself from your thoughts and really trying to become um, positioned their posi in their position. Um, increasing opportunity for contact is in building relationships, having relationships with people beyond your own racial or cultural group that are in your personal life, not just in places that you must be or like work. Um, stereotype replacement and counter stereotyping imaging are similar where they are two approaches where you intentionally 
fight against stereotypes. So listening to what a stereotype might be, but replacing it with the actual opposite and then applying that example to people that you're interacting with that are from a group where that stereotype applies. And then the, the last two are um, studies around building a relationship and connecting. And so tracking personal information, learning about a person, and then really repeating it back to them as you see them and acknowledging those unique aspects of them. And then banking time is really listening and, and spending time validating. So these, these techniques are not only to fight against those cultural blind spots, but they also can be and should be part of interventions that you're doing with the youth that you're serving. You can even help other adults that are working with a, a population of youth by pointing out ways to, to use these techniques. Next slide, please. So the next couple of slides, I'm going to be talking about the silent struggles that affect BIPOC youth. And I want to start with a video because I feel like the youth tell it, say it better than me. So next slide. Oh, you're so pretty for a black girl. Oh, she has a Jew nose. Oh, your hair would look so good if it was straight. Jews are so cheap. Why are you so cheap? Do you speak um, good English? How are you an Iraqi Jew? I think the person saying microaggression kind of doesn't really think about it. This person who said it was my friend, and like I was astonished that they would like say something like that. You don't want to make a big deal about it, but then it's also like you just said something that offended me, so I feel like I should speak up. Because they're micro, because they're um, very subtle, they, they're small. You feel like you don't have a reason to be upset. You're overreacting and people even can make you feel that way when you bring it up. They're like, oh, you can't take a joke. You're making too big of a deal for this. Why are you overreacting? Don't take it so seriously. It was just a joke. Chill out. Say so like, oh no, I actually love black people. I love people of color. Like they try to just minimize the situation. If someone feels hurt by a microaggression, it shouldn't just be pushed to the side. It definitely has negative impacts and like leads to people disliking who they actually are. Those kinds of subtle offensive comments can build up over time and they can have like a deep psychological effect and you know they can make you feel bad and they can make you doubt yourself. We try to just use jokes to like make things less awkward or like ease social experiences but it is important because you need to like be aware of what you're saying and like who you're speaking to. Think of what you say and how it can affect the person you're saying it to. I find that video to be so powerful because those young people are so articulate about their experience, not just what the experience is, but what it does to them and what it means to them over time and how it impacts their self-esteem. I, I hope you saw the numbers that they, they said 291, the study was showing 291 microaggressions in a matter of months. It's, it's incredible as you think about how pervasive they are, and I probably should define it because they kind of didn't define it for you. So what microaggressions are, they're brief everyday exchanges. And what they do is they send denigrating messages to certain people because of their group membership. And the statements usually affirm stereotypes about a, a group, group member, and they're usually subtle insults. They're considered microaggressions because they're unintentional by the deliverer. We've all done it. We've all made the mistake. But we have to know that because, even though they're unintentional to the deliverer, they feel like tiny little cuts to the receiver. They just do. So when we're not self-aware, we are sometimes unable to recognize when our words negatively impact other people. And they unfortunately happen in the midst of interactions that can happen anytime, being, just being in conversation. And um, it's, it's tough because when they happen, oftentimes what happens, I call this a silent struggle for many youth, because then they don't have anybody to go talk to about it. Or they have a friend, but they can't get to them right away because they have to go into class and 
they have to sit with it and they try to make sense of it and they make sense try to make sense of it in the context of the relationship that they have with the person that delivered the the microaggression so I love showing that video because of the way they frame it. And I think that it makes it really real for a lot of people. What I, what I want you to take away from it at this time you've, that you've seen it and heard about microaggressions is many and most youth uh, of color in particular are dealing with it in silence. Next slide, please. So if we think about now, we've got implicit bias that is, is one of those things, those automatic shortcuts that are impacting the relationships that, um, that the youth are experiencing. And then we have microaggressions. Notice the connection that oftentimes microaggressions are steeped in stereotypes, much like implicit biases. They start to have, uh, uh, their identity starts getting impacted because they're having repeated experiences with that bias and those um, microaggressions being delivered, and they start to learn how stereotypes are applied to them. And they start feeling powerless in shaping their own identity. They learn that there are limits to what they can control. So for example, so when um, ev evidence of implicit bias occurs or microaggressions are delivered, they experience an immediate fear of confirming a negative stereotype, especially when it's attached to a stereotype. And this is referred to as stereotype threat. Some people respond in a way where they give the opposite reaction to uh, a, the threat of a stereotype being applied to them. Others, passively accept the assumption and they just kind of go with it and just say, well, they're going to think what they're going to think and I'm just going to ignore it. Some even give up and they will enact the stereotype as a way of taking ownership of and control over it. But all of these responses, they're all subtle experiences. They're all happening inside their head and they take up a whole lot of headspace. So this process of stereotype threat, it impacts development, and growth and can hinder academic achievement. There's lots and lots of studies that you can read uh, about stereotype threat. If you wanna learn more, um, look at uh, the work of Claude Steele and Joshua Aronson as to that have done many studies of adolescents in school settings and the impact of stereotype threat on their academics. So now we've got a couple of concepts here that are part of the silent struggles, the implicit bias, we have microaggressions, now we have stereotype threat, and these are all subtle manifestations of discrimination, which is one of those community aces that I mentioned before. Next slide, please. So this slide, what I would like you to see is how it all fits together. Next slide, please. So on this slide, I have a um, interaction that is occurring between a teacher and a student. And so the teacher, as the student walks in, her name is Tanisha, the um, he says, you should be on time, Tanisha. You need all the time we have to learn the material. And the thought bubble above Tanisha says, oh, I bet he thinks all black people are always late. So she was responding to a stereotype about black people and feeling insecure about she was arriving to class late. But there was also something in his statement and it was a it was an inflection on a particular word that may also affect Tanisha as she's walking to her seat to go and sit down and it was the word all when he said you need all the time we have to learn the material. The first part where she responded to the lateness and was thinking about or in feeling insecure about the, the lateness, that is a stereotype around time and respect for time in the black community. But she also then may notice the microaggression, the one about intellect, about she needs all the time we have to learn the material. Those were embedded in his words, and that can disrupt learning. If you could imagine Tanisha walking to her seat, going, oh my gosh, I can't believe I'm late, and I, I had to, but I couldn't help it. And then she sits down and she's like, wait, he said, I need all the time we have. And he said it in front of everybody. Does everybody think I'm dumb? Maybe I am dumb. I don't know. Maybe I do need all the time, because it really takes someone to, to tell me things multiple times. And every time I learn it, I, it doesn't really stick. So, I shouldn't be here. 
So I say all of that is a little exaggerating there, but at the same time, look, look and listen to how much headspace that took up, that she's over-processing. Do you think she learned anything that he was teaching in that time while she's sitting there over-processing, trying to make sense of the microaggression that was delivered publicly in front of her classmates? She's probably learning nothing. And on top of that, she's probably not telling anybody that that's what she just experienced because it's so common that she's just kind of got to work through it on her own. It's a silent struggle. But let me show you a different one quick, please. The teacher says, May Lee, will you explain the concept to the class? I'm sure you understand. And May Lee, her little thought bubble says, I better pretend like I get it and be the smart Asian he expects. She's responding to the stereotype of the model minority myth that we have around Asian Americans and intellect. He's suggesting that she's more likely to understand the material, potentially because she's Asian, and she is responding to that stereotype. The model minority myth is a harmful stereotype as well. And in particular, it's because that is not truth for everyone. And so if it's an assumption or an expectation, then it's even more damaging to an Asian student who isn't understanding the material. They're feeling even more inferior and like something is really wrong with them. So here's another version, a way that a teacher can say something to a student and the student respond in internally and not have anyone to talk to about it. It's a silent struggle. And then the last thought bubble is just one where the, student, the teacher didn't say anything, but the student is still having an, uh, a feeling around why they're placed in the back of the room. And they're, they're making an assumption. They put, I, why should I pay attention? They're, um, he put me back here for a reason. And that could be nothing to do with that teacher. It could be related to other experiences that they had in other classes where they positioned people in a certain way. But all of these, I just, you know, they're, they're kind of strong examples. They're all real examples of um, kids that I've worked with that have told me that these are things that they have had said to them. But they, they're all examples of how interactions can promote a stress response and disrupt learning for youth and be that invisible or silent struggle. And for adults, it's these internal conversations we are not privy to. So there's this huge cognitive load on the students, but we have no idea that this is what they're going through and what they're experiencing unless we create the space and context for it. Next slide, please. So our kids, they send out an SOS and they do it different ways. So kids and adolescents, they, they have different ways of sending out the signals of distress and they may vary by gender, by personality, by cultural values and by life experiences. Irritability, anger, sadness, those are pretty easy to recognize for most of us. But what we don't recognize are things like isolation, anxiety, avoidance, and even apathy. So when we pay attention to these silent struggles, we may get a window into the isolation, avoidance, apathy, and, and anxiety. But without an intentional focus on addressing these hard to see emotions, we just may miss things that can actually really help them. We can also make things worse. There are things that we do to encourage BIPOC youth to internalize their emotions and avoid asking us for help. Here's some examples. Next slide, please. So minimization. I think you might be taking that out of context. Or are you sure you aren't being too sensitive? Or dismissiveness oh, I'm sure that's not what they meant. Or defensiveness. Well, I am certain your teacher has the best of intentions. I'm sure these sound familiar. We've all said them at some point or another. Recognize that these are encouraging our youth not to share. We're encouraging them to hold things in and internalize them as if it's their problem, not someone else's. So keep in mind that we're lucky when BIPOC youth trust us enough to talk or defend, defend themselves or advocate for themselves. So if we do these things, minimization, dismissive um, statements or defensiveness, we destroy that trust. So be careful about what you say and lean in the direction of listening even more. 
Next slide, please. So a couple things. One, one thing that I really think is important for us to know is we have plenty of research that shows that resilience from ACEs can be activated by the existence of safe, nurturing relationships with adults and peers. We know this. It is absolutely clear and it's been replicated across many studies and meta-analyses. So part of this is listening, validating their feelings, sharing counter narratives to implicit bias, stereotype, and microaggressions. That's part of it. But I want to share a study that I did um, years ago where I was looking, going back to chronic community violence and complex post-traumatic stress disorder. Next slide, please. And you can click through. There, it, I was looking at chronic community violence and complex post-traumatic stress disorder. And what I wanted to do was identify cultural variables that I thought exist in African-American families that might be protective factors and identified three that I was trying to study. So formal kinship, the um, blood relationships that are among family members, and then informal kinship. And these are people that are uh, family, they're perceived as family, but they're actually not blood related. So in my family, we refer to them as play cousins or auntie or uncle or big mama. Those were people that were in my life that really were perceived as family. And there was some one in particular, an uncle that I actually thought was my uncle and wasn't my uncle, but that's because that was how ingrained they were to the family. And then spirituality, the ways in which black families use spirituality to cope with um, conflict and adversity. And what I found in the study was that all those that had the most of all three of these variables, that there was actually a buffering effect where they showed the least amount of complex post-traumatic stress disorder because of the existence of these factors, regardless of the kind of violence they were exposed to. And, and these youth, they were between the ages of 11 and 15 and had been exposed to um, murder and um, severe violence and, and still showed fewer symptoms of um, complex PTSD when they had access to these protective mechanisms. So as we, next slide please. Um, as we try to do our best to respond to the SOS, we want to recognize that um, adverse childhood experiences exposure create toxic stress. The interventions that we typically do are for symptom reduction. So we'll do things like teaching emotion regulation skills and doing psychoeducation about what trauma is. Click please. And that rarely includes cultural integration. Click please. If we think about interventions that are resilience focused, then we're going to add on and include things like identifying and applying individual strengths. We will also be doing such as maximizing relationships and we'll also be fostering community support. Click please. And this often includes cultural integration. So if we focus on both symptom reduction and resilience promotion, it requires integrating the sociocultural context. Next slide, please. So I'd like to kind of end with a, a metaphor that I like to use to help folks um, understand the ways in which I think about resilience. So I'm showing a cell here. And what I want you to see about this cell is I see resilience as the nucleus of the cell or the center and the core of the cell. So as if you're familiar with kind of microbiology that um, the nucleus of the cell has a fluid around it called cytoplasm. And this fluid is designed to protect the nucleus. So what I have inside this cell here is resilience as the nucleus and the cytoplasm, including cultural factors that I believe for um, many communities of color are protective. So things such as having um, a strong sense of spirituality or the kinship that I described in the previous study, racial socialization where family members are really helping youth understand and know the ways um, that they um, can be successful and cope with conflict around their racial identity. Building racial and ethnic identity as part of who they are and um, feeling good and confident about that. Um, be having a collectivistic a perspective where you're one of community, not just an individual. And 
cultural norms and, and an understanding of acculturation, that all of those things are protected. And if we recognize that for resilience in the nucleus to be maintained, the environment, the cytoplasm, must be safe for healthy growth. And when protective factors are ignored by the nurturing environment that the cell lives in, maybe schools, it implies that they're unimportant. So if our, if our nurturing environment does not pay attention to these protective factors inside the cell, it implies that they're unimportant. And that minimization weakens the cell membrane, which is the outside, that, that light green line. And it makes the person more vulnerable to pathogens. Click, please. The pathogens in this metaphor are things such as implicit bias and ACEs and stereotype threat and those microaggressions that I talked about. If this pathogen binds with this healthy cell, it can break it down completely until the nucleus is absorbed. That destroys the cell and subsequently destroys resilience. So I am of the mind that culture responsive practices not only protect the nucleus, but they also strengthen that cell membrane so that the pathogen cannot bind with the healthy cell. So keep that image in mind as you think about the importance of cultural factors and as protective. Next slide, please. So if we intentionally foster resilience and we keep in awareness the full identities of our youth, Kids will not have to endure school. Kids of color, BIPOC kids, will not have to endure school. They can thrive in resilience. So I have several slides that will be shared with you that have all of the references that I was citing so you can read more. But I'd like to open it up for questions now, please. Great. Um, thank you so much, Dr. Jones, um, for really your wisdom and your conversation today um, to really give us a way to foster resilience and honor our full identities, right, of the students that we engage with. And one of the things I'm definitely walking away with is you talked about those little cuts, right? Like that mm -hmm. it was such a, it caused such a visceral reaction for me that I, I um, you know, I know that I'm thinking about that today um, and have experienced that, right, as an adult. And then thinking about, like, when I was a youth worker years ago, like, thinking about how I would hear young people also share that a very similar kind of response. But you gave language to something that I knew I thought about and felt, but have never really framed it in those words. So I appreciate yeah. Thank you for, for sharing your, your platica today with us. Thank you. Um, you know, one of the questions that I, I did want to um, ask you and, and um, offer for, for our conversation today is, you know, you mentioned um, uh, engaging adults and addressing ACEs. Yeah. Uh, do, do you have advice for adolescent practitioners, many who are here today, in engaging, you know, a, a adults and caregivers in a healthy and helpful way? Yes, yes. Well, Dr. Jen Wright yesterday, when he talked about engaging the grandmamas, do you remember that in his talk yesterday? That's an example of bringing in people in the community that are trusted. With adolescents, I know they oftentimes don't want their parents involved. Um, we, we, we don't try hard enough for that at times um, to get them included. Um, when I was in private practice, I was in private practice for 13 years and part of my work I established from the beginning that I didn't, with families, I didn't see kids in isolation. That's what I told every single parent and child and that I was working with. I said, I will split the time where we do individual work and we do family work. And part of what will happen when I do the individual work is I am empowering their child to help them understand them better. So I'm teaching them how to communicate and I'm kind of like a, 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 a facilitator of that. So in private practice, it's easier to do. In schools, it's a little bit harder, but 
I did work for um, a community mental health agency in Los Angeles years ago where we had a school-based health center and brought families in in the evenings. And this was in the 90s when we did that. And so part of what we did is we had individual um, sessions with kids during the day. And then in the evenings, we um, like late after school hours, we'd have family come in and be able to build upon the work that we were doing. It was it was in the, kind of the Hawthorne area, the, the school that we were serving. And it was that was actually one of my favorite jobs because it felt like I really could see the impact of the work that we were doing. So it's if you can't get people families engaged into the work, and that can be anybody that's that's a it doesn't have to be a blood family member, like I said. It could be informal kin that participate, um, somebody that they trust, a, a mentor, somebody that is, is, that is connected to them. It extends the likelihood that the work that you're doing with them individually will expand out to another context, into another environment. It gives them the, um, the opportunity to practice without just having to be present with you and practice just, you know, when it's a new skill or managing a um, an emotion or a situation on their own and trying to struggle through it. So really just, you know, spending the time to think about who needs to be a part of this and then encouraging them, the person, the youth that you're working with to engage them either outside of your sessions or um, invite them to participate in the sessions too. Great. Yeah, thank you for that. That's such a great uh, perspective um, that you're sharing with us about um, what that care looked like, right? A whole mm -hmm. village of care, right, for a young person. Mm -hmm. So bear with me a little bit because I'm going to read a statement that's coming from an audience member, a comment. So um, the example with a young Black woman and teachers on point. Um, in conversations with teachers around these kinds of exchanges, they say, uh, quote, uh, but I say the same thing to every student, end quote. Uh, they don't see or are unwilling to take on how this, that particular phrase lines up with a stereotype threat and lands differently on BIPOC students. Teachers must be accountable to how their speech may land differently for different people. This asks for a new and unfamiliar level of accountability from teachers. Would you like to comment on that? Well, I, I, this is one of those where I'm, yes, yes, <laughs> heard it, <laughs> heard it before. Okay. <laughs> yeah. And oftentimes where, um, I don't like shaming people, I can say that. Um, right. So part of what I do is help people try to understand that it, it's, it's like that, um, that example I was talking about where you are doing perspective taking and asking, this, the teacher, where I've had individual consults with teachers and I've said, before I say what I'm about to say to you, try your very best not to say yes, but either out mm. loud or in your head. And then I just ask them to pause. And then I will give them the perspective of the student and the ways in which they ex may have experienced it and say, this is different from your experience. and may be different from my experience, but what I do know is it's a real experience. That means we have to have different language if we don't want it to impact some people differentially. You may say the same phrase to every student, but it doesn't mean it lands that way. And so they often, when I say things like that and just say, so you know, there's it sounds like there's a stereotype under that. And there's another way that you could deliver the same message. What could we say instead? Let's brainstorm and then brainstorm with them. But it's it's the the hard thing is is the defensiveness that comes from identifying when something is damaging that um, you have to when you're the professional working with a colleague that you have to be really careful about understanding that defensiveness is likely and it's a protective mechanism. That's what we do is we we do what we can to feel okay about ourselves but it doesn't mean that they're going to do it again it does mean that they may walk away and go okay yeah i'm not doing that again i'm not going to admit it to you but i'm not going to do that again <laughs> right right yeah i appreciate that kind of um coaching framework that you provided right like before i, I would give you this you set it up right yeah. pause that background noise of yes but right that's some mm -hmm. helps set the framework of like the delivery of the message and setting up the conversation right that's yeah. a, 
a helpful tool. I think a similar um, a similar kind of uh, framework to operate from is a, there's a question about just excuse me um, what what suggestions do you have as as another kind of starting point for guiding an existing school based health team both clinical and programmatic through education in this area as a first step like another kind of helpful tools um, things to think about when they're having these types of conversations what suggestions do you have? Yeah, Whew. Uh, <laughs> to uh, have conversations in love. Um, don't be afraid. I, I think that one of the biggest challenges that we have when it comes to breaking through patterns of, um, of delivering microaggressions and, and being, um, you know, having implicit bias kind of guide our thinking is that we're afraid to identify it and talk about it. And nobody wants to be the one to facilitate it. When you allow for it to become part of uh, the narrative of what you understand when you're thinking about youth and you're thinking about the referrals that you're getting for assessment or counseling or whatever, of all of those things, if you have a conversation, then it's less likely to interfere. Remember, that's the danger of implicit bias is that it's unconscious. It's if, if we don't bring it to consciousness, it is going to get in the way. So if you just stay to practice, state things, state what you're thinking about and planning, look at your data, look and see who's who are the people that are getting served in a particular setting. Like, over and over, we see young black boys in behavior disorder classrooms and the prevalence of behavior disorders is not that high. But the way that it looks is we are, we are perpetrating the same biases and practices without paying attention to that um, our experiences may be shaping why we're picking that outcome for some kids and not for other kids. So. Sorry, that was kind of a roundabout, <laughs> roundabout way to, to answer, but having and being direct and having open and honest conversations is kind of the key and not shying away from them. I can say in one of the practices that I see a lot of school districts doing now is having um, equity teams for each school and then also having equity trainings that continuously happen so it's not the one time drive by kind of experience where it's like, yeah, I showed up, I learned something in that moment, but I didn't apply it anywhere else. You know, I um, for when I do trainings for school psychologists, I actually give lots of questions to ask as building a sociocultural history that are grounded in what how do you learn about their culture? How do you learn about what the values and worldview and assumptions and the ways in which their racial identity impacts them? I build it from the beginning with all of my students where it's like, they're like, I can't ask that question. I'm like, yes, you can, and here's why. And when they do, they find out, oh my gosh, I just opened up an opportunity with this family so that they recognize that I understand that race is an important factor in their life. I'm not pretending like it doesn't exist and I'm not pretending like it doesn't matter as much. I created the context for respecting and paying attention to culture. And so I use I use questions and and build a sociocultural history around it. And that's why it becomes the foundation of treatment. So it's not a starting point. It's kind of like it's a practice that you just in you engage in regularly. Yeah, and I think you know that that that's so great that you share that, right? Because I think many school systems are setting up those equity trainings or their PBIS work. Um, and I did, you know, I was thinking about what, you know, my next kind of question was you started talking about it, about, you know, what what, what are some of those culturally resilient or responsive processes in schools? Mm -hmm. And I'm also curious if maybe we could close out um, as we get ready to close out. You could. If I could ask you to just maybe lean in a little bit more so folks could leave with what are the questions, maybe one or two questions that Dr. Jones uses to those school psychologists. Um, you know, what are some of those leading questions that you use to prompt those school psychologists around social cultural history? Like what, what how did you how do you help them ask those questions? What what are some of those examples so folks can maybe leave with? Let me try to test one of these out. <laughs> you okay. know, one of the questions that Dr. Jones has tried to use, and maybe they can model those. Yeah. So I actually have it's a one page, 
not one page, two page document that um, I have, it's called the Jones Intentional Multicultural Interview Schedule. And it has a- I said I got two pages for you. <laughs> <laughs> nice. so I'm gonna share it. I will definitely, I'll give it so that it will be a handout that you will have access to. And what it includes is I, um, I borrowed an acronym from a colleague, Pamela Hayes, and it's called, she uses what's called the addressing framework. So if you've ever read anything about culture responsive therapy practices, she includes this addressing framework as categories of things to, to pay attention to when you want to understand the culture of another person. So um, they're like A is for age and, and um, D is disability status. And so I will share it, um, the two pager because it frames it with those addressing categories and then kind of the population that you need to be using these with or what cat, what kinds of things you're trying to learn. And then a list of questions and the questions include things like, in what ways does your race impact you every day? How do you, um, and what, what experiences do you have when it comes to your um, skin color or hair in the context that you are interacting with people? So it's real direct questions. Mm -hmm. Those, I put, I picked those on purpose right now because those are the ones everybody's like, ah, I can't ask that question. Right, <laughs> right. And you also gotta be ready for the response, right? <laughs> when you ask those, you gotta be ready about how to respond, absolutely. That's right. That's right. And sometimes the response. So I'll, I'll just say this, that I, I get the fear response from folks and I'm often and they're like, but I'm white. I can't ask that of a black family. And I'm like, why not? Mm -hmm. Right with me. Let's just right. see. You know, and so then they'll ask me and then I respond and say, well, these are this is an experience that I've had this. These are some ways like. I am newly curly since COVID and I would never wear my hair curly to do a speaking engagement like this. It would mm. only go straight because I felt like people didn't see me as professional. Now I've adjusted to that, but right. it years, years where I felt that way. And so that produced, asking that question about issues with your hair produced an opportunity for me to share that that's a part of my identity and the ways in which I have grown over time and gotten more comfortable with myself. So I I can I tell a story often of one of my students that didn't want to ask the question about in what ways does your race impact you every day and was scared to do it. And so we practiced in the mirror asking me. They finally did. They had five sessions with a family before they were willing to do it. And they I was watching this family through the one way mirror, like uncomfortable, like not wanting to share anything. And they asked the question and I watched the mom's shoulders just drop. And the son was like looked up and both of them were like, we're so glad you asked that. And then the son just went all in. He was like, all of my teachers hate me. They always talk about me and my dark skin and blah, blah, blah. And the students and the, the stories just went blah, blah, blah. And the mom was like, we needed to know that it was okay. Because black youth are socialized not to talk about racism and the experiences that they have with, uh, with people that are white. They're socialized not to do that because it makes white people uncomfortable. Right. And so you should know that if you come in with, I understand that this is important, you create the, the safe context for that conversation to happen. So when I share the gymist with you, that's the, all, the list of questions attached to the addressing framework. You'll see there are lots of questions on there that are really benign and not scary and others that are more scary if you, and you just need to work through it and just realize that the relationship that you have with the clients that you're working with will change if you create a context for safe conversations around these issues those silent struggles you know just i i am in so much gratitude from the earth to the sky for your conversation today your wisdom your words i know my cup is full and i, I and i'm sure and i hope that our attendees today as well um, just thank you so much for your words and your wisdom and the tangible tools that I feel that I know I could walk away with today. And I'm looking in the comments, there's lots of love uh, being uh, given through the comments uh, for your wisdom and your work um, that uh, people are, are shouting out um, to you and to each other. Um, so just wanna put that out there to you as well. Um, 
And so thank you again, uh, Dr. Jones, for your work today and for the, the contribution to the field, because we need you. We need, we need this work for our, our babies, right? And for our, our generations to come. So thank you for that. Thank uh, you, Cynthia. I appreciate you.